Uh, but the 4050 is our most popular selling studio mic. Okay. It gives you a nice flat response. Um, it's multi-pattern, so you can do an omnidirectional recording, figure of eight, or cardioid. Um, works great with instruments, uh, voices. A lot of folks have used it on uh, guitar cabinets. So it's a very versatile mic, and people like to use it all through the studio. Um, the next mic over is our AT48, and it's our ribbon mic. Um, and it only needs a 48 volt phantom power. You don't need an out, outboard transformer for it to, to work. Don't need to worry about setting up your uh, preamps or anything to make it sound good. 48 volt power comes in, goes out, has a nice fit, a uh, nice rich fat sound. Um, you know, similar to the RCA 77s. Okay. Uh, this is a, this is just a uh, cardioid condenser. Cardioid. Okay, with with a, double it's pairs. A, it's, it's about an inch. Yeah. yeah. It, yeah, it's and a, it's this a inch. Has different kind of yes, it's a ribbon. It's a bi, uh, bi-directional ribbon um, in there that accepts the sound. Okay. Um, it's a little bit different um, so where it, they it make. Because from both directions, I know on this microphone I have to turn just it. Just one, right? Yeah. yeah this is and a single this direction. One also? Well, no, this will uh, accept sound it, from both sides. Both sides. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So, and very good for vocals more than more than instruments. It's a nice big okay. fat rich sound. Now this is our new microphone, which is an AT5040. What, what makes it, it's, a, it's sort of a brand new design in, in diaphragms. It's just a cardioid condenser. And what we've done is we've taken four rectangular um, diaphragms and summed it into one. Okay. What that gives you is a larger diaphragm. But you don't have to make it as thick as if you made it just one round diaphragm. So it, we still, all our diaphragms are two microns thin, so that it accepts the sound better. But having the bigger um, diaphragm gives you um, more frequency response up and down, a smoother bass, a much smoother top end, um, without any kind of pad or any kind of roll off at all. So it's a pure sounding microphone um, that's gotten very, very good reviews lately. So price wise, this is like around. Um, this is about a thousand dollars. A thousand dollars. Yep. Okay. This one also about a thousand dollars. This one is three thousand thousand dollars. Three thousand dollars. Yep. Uh-huh. It's a brand new design, a brand new way to look at uh, how as to do it. As far as the signal going to the camera, this is the strongest signal? Or That'd the be the hottest output, yep. Okay. Yep. And they are all 48 uh, Phantom? Yes, they all 48 volt Phantom power, okay. correct. Yeah, so. the, the sound is fantastic. Yeah, thank yeah, you I'm very much. I noticed, <laughs> and I appreciate it. Yeah. I mean, if you have the Shockman is a brand new design yeah, also with yeah. magnets and clipping. Instead of having to... Yep, a lot easier to, to use. Yeah, this is great and we made design. it so it doesn't vibrate, so you don't get any microphonics on it. Uh, no, I don't think it'll fit. Yeah, it's a, it's a little fatter. So you put that in, it's going to fall and break. Here at the NAB show 2013, and I'm talking to Richard. Okay, I'm talking with Richard here at Carl Zeiss. You're holding the camera, tilt it, make it, make it straight, straight. Turn it a little bit, turn it, turn it. Okay. Huh? It's funny, who is the cameraman? <laughs> so we started on the top with our Master Primes. The Master Primes are the highest image quality we provide. These are T1.3, used on major feature films. Uh, these are lenses that perform optically, are very superior at T1.3. You can use the lenses wide open. And there's no breathing in these lenses at all. So we achieve this through a double floating lens element. So mechanically, it's a, it's a, it's a superior design. So these are the best motion picture lenses that Zeiss manufactures today. And uh, like 25,000? 20, 20, is uh, sold directly by Ari. And we have our ultra prime lenses. Our Ultra Primes are T1.9s. These are really the workhorses in the industry. Uh, Wide range of lenses and uh, lots of different focal lengths. Uh, These lenses are extremely popular for both 3D capture as well as 2D capture. Being used on feature films, episodic TV shows. Just a really nice uh, set of lenses. Also sold directly by Ari. On this level here, we have our Compact Primes. Compact Primes are uh, targeted to entry-level filmmakers. So they're priced to be affordable, anywhere in the $4,000 to about $5,700 range. These lenses are derived from, on the bottom row, our SLR lenses. So for instance, we'll take the glass on the 85-1.4, and this is the lens. And we put them in city-style barrels. So they cover the biggest sensor size on the market, which is a 24 by 36. They cover the big image circle size, and they provide the resolution that uh, is necessary for a 4K, 6K sort of camera. 
these are the 1.4 ratio. So, so, so we have three T1 pods, and then we have a line of lenses that are either T2.1s or the ultra-wides are T2.9. Our companion lenses are the compact zooms. So these are companion lenses to both master primes, ultra primes, as well as the compact primes. We are showing for the first time the new 28 to 80. Yeah, I haven't seen that before. So T2.9, also full frame covers, 24 by 36 chip, interchangeable lens mounts like our CP2s. You have a choice of five different lens mount options. So rental houses or users can simply swap the mounts out as their cameras change. So our lenses are really independent of cameras. You invest in a good set of lenses, it doesn't matter what camera you use today or in the future. I'm at Carl Zeiss booth right now. At NAB 2013, I'm speaking to Richard. And Richard, um, always looking at these lenses and how expensive they are mm. and how good they are, uh, I'd like to know about the resolution uh -huh. and how you basically um, qualify these lenses to deliver um, the quality that you are claiming right. they have. So we measure our lenses uh, using a modulation transfer function, MTF. So Zeiss invented this as a objective way of measuring uh, contrast in a lens and its ability to separate you know, differences between black and white, essentially. So MTF for us, we measure 10, 20, and 40 line pairs per millimeter. So we don't publish this information on our cine lenses, but we do for our SLR lenses. But I can tell you that you know, areas, you know, 10 line pairs per millimeter is typically areas of broad contrast. So it's the difference between the, the black lens and a white background. So not a lot of detail, but again, it's, it's uh, you know, areas of kind of this broad contrast. 20 line pairs per millimeter could be finer detail, 40 even finer detail. And the closer you can, the closer the lens can perform to 100% contrast, higher the quality, higher, the, the better the, um, that lens is, is in uh, separating the small differences between that kind of the black and the white. So they don't become muddy, they don't become gray, and they don't hold the resolution, the apparent resolution down. So we test our lenses using MTF function. And our lenses are designed for, you know, today, you know, a lot of the master primes and ultra primes were designed back in the film days. Of course, the market is moving towards digital capture. The lenses still hold up really well for a digital capture. Our master primes and ultra primes are sold directly by RE worldwide, and they are promoted with high-end cameras like the Alexa, and like the Sony F65, the RED, high-end cameras like this. Our masters, really what sets, uh, separates them apart is that they are T1.3, and they maintain this, this very high resolution and sharpness at a wide open aperture. And we also design the lenses with double floating lens elements to eliminate any breathing whatsoever. So it's a complex lens mechanically. Optically, it's a very superior lens at a T1.3. With that breathing design, yeah. uh, you're basically using more elements probably to yeah, create? more elements okay. and, and mechanically it's a different uh, okay. way of controlling focus movement than we have with ultra primes. I see, so you actually also linearize the focusing also a yeah. little bit. Yes. I see, I heard that. So a floating lens element will do that. So it, it's moving lens groupings in a non-linear function, depending on where your focus barrel is positioned. Right. See, uh, comparing this with the older Zeiss, that's all over the place right now. Standard speed, super speeds. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm talking about the film era, yeah. the film era Zeiss. Mm -hmm. um, right now you're introducing these new lenses. Are they are newly designed? No, I mean the Masters and the Ultras have been on the market for a number of years now. The okay, compact so primes are kind of the newest lenses that we're bringing out to the so marketplace. So the lens barrel has changed? Nope. No, I mean, it, it, I mean the Master primes and Ultra primes, mechanically and optically there hasn't been any changes in these designs for a number of years now. Uh, when you say number of years, how many years do you have more? Um, to be honest with you, I'm not sure. I would say maybe a good years? 10 years. 10 years? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Now, if you're shooting in a low light situation, adding light is expensive to do. All right, you have to rent the gear, you need power for it. Sure. People, so people want to be able to shoot wide open. So there was a need for a fast T13 lens to shoot on film stock. Nowadays, you're often in a situation where the camera is too fast. 
and I have to throw ND filters in front of it when I'm shooting outdoors. Sure. Right? I've seen that done all the time. All the time, yeah. right. <laughs> but there's still, I mean, the master primes are promoted for high-end feature films, ultra primes as well. Because of their size and their weight, they're very popular on small rigs and for 3D applications. Right. Um, T1.9, again, a full range of lenses from you know, 8 millimeter on up. Um, and again, as I said, sold directly by Ari. Yeah. Now, how do these lenses work, maybe t to address your point, on 4K and higher cameras, yeah. right? So, for us, there's two different ways that camera manufacturers achieve high resolution in a camera. They do that by packing more pixels into a Super 35 format, and in some cases where camera manufacturers are going to physically bigger sensors and keeping the pixel size the same. So as an example, the Sony F65, they pack more pixels into a Super 35 sensor. So it's a four micron pixel size. And we know from our still photography business that the camera like a D800, which is also four microns, when you mount lenses to the camera, that camera separates good lenses from bad lenses very, very quickly, right? You either are able to, f to resolve that very fine photo site and you know, the small pixel size, not just in the center, but out at the frame edges, and you need good glass to do this. And it's no different with the F65 on the Sony side. There's other manufacturers, let's say like the, the new Red Dragon sensor, they achieve 6K resolution with a slightly bigger sensor size, right? So if you look at those two different paths, do I pack more pixels into the same physical chip or do I go with a little bigger chip to achieve that resolution? That affects your lensing requirement and what lenses you want to put on it. Our masters and ultras are going to work really well on a camera like an F65. They will be able to resolve that fine four micron pixel size. But if you're talking about a chip that gets larger and requires a bigger image circle coverage, the masters and ultras won't cover that. They're going to cover a Super 35 chip on a diagonal without any problem. Mm -hmm. But you start talking a 6K Dragon sensor, you start yeah, talking... Yeah. Making the, the chip bigger. Exactly. Right? Or you start talking a 24 by 36 sensor like the Canon so 1DC, yeah. they won't cover it. So there we're looking at our compact primes. Our compact because primes... Because designed for full frame 35 Exactly, yeah. exactly. And we see that you know within the lifespan of these lenses, bigger chips are going to become more common. And so our compact primes are being promoted for use for those cameras, and that our lenses allow the filmmaker to become independent of their camera. That an investment in these lenses, it really doesn't matter what camera you put them on, they'll cover the bigger sensor, they'll resolve the small uh, you know, uh, micro, you know, pixel size, because our SLR lenses were designed for high resolution DSLR cameras, 50 megapixel or, or higher. So, and lens's ability to hold that, that contrast from the center out to the edge is really what separates you know, good lenses from bad lenses. And our lenses do extremely well in that regard. So, and that's, there's really three things that, that we believe are um, the foundations of a good lens, right? It's good design, it's the materials, and it's the build quality. And it's like a three-legged stool. One of them fail, in any reason, it, the lens yeah, falls apart. Very good. They're very good. Yeah. You know, they, they have decades of experience yeah. in terms of lens, lens design. It's really not just a computer design. It's actually a designer has influence in terms of the, the final image quality. Because we live in a three-dimensional world. We record in two dimensions. All right, and a lens can't be flat. It can't be sterile. A lens has to be able to show a three-dimensional modeling because that's what gives the lens character. All right, and that's what filmmakers are looking for. They're looking for lenses that add that character and then that filmmaker then, you know, they get used to the look and that becomes kind of their signature, becomes part of their style. And the anti-reflective coating and the light traps that we built into the lens to capture straight light play an important role in the lens's resolution from the center out to the edge. So that's really the design and the build quality that really influence um, how well that lens is gonna perform on a high resolution sensor. So in the back of my mind, Richard, uh, you're not telling me how many lines. I, I came here to find out how many. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to have to go rent these and project it and find out the answer. <laughs> we, it's not, yeah. it's not data that uh, I'm not even aware of. We don't measure our lenses line pairs per I'm millimeter. Very surprised at that. Yeah. Because if you claim 5K, you claim 6K, uh, you are basically claiming, like for uh, for a five micron pixel, you know, like we discussed. Uh, you would have uh, two, you need uh, 200 lines 
uh, per millimeter to have the airy disc at uh, five micron, mm -hmm. and to have to be able to resolve that, you need two and a half micron. That means four hundred lines per millimeter. I'm just surprised Zeiss doesn't look at it as. We don't even publish MTF data on our cinnamon lenses. Ah, okay. We, the only the only time we publish MTF data is with our SLR stock, and that technical information is up on our website. So we share that, but not so with this. Okay. Um, so as far as filmmakers, everybody's fascinated with master primes. Uh -huh. Every time I tell someone, I have Zeiss collection of lenses, they say, you have master primes? I say, what do you want it for? You know what I'm saying? Um, they are for a special kind of Kubrick candlelight, right? Yes. I mean, you don't have to pay $25,000, I mean, $23,000 for it. You know, these lenses are, are mostly rented. Okay. They're, they're not, they're not uh, you know, they're not positioned to the owner operator. Yes, you know, it's, it's mostly, you know, feature films are going to come and they're going to go to a, a rental shop and then they're going to use them for but the length of the project. But also the rental cost will be more, of course. Yes. Yeah. So, these are the... Ultra Primes? Yeah, these are the... So, th again, this is both a rental as well as an owner-operator. These are, you know, more affordable yeah. than the Master yeah. Prime. And, you know, they're workhorses. I mean, they're, yeah. they're, they're proven lenses in the industry. They're widely recognized for yeah. image quality, fast aperture, small, lightweight. People, I've heard people say, you know, these are just converted from 35 millimeter glass to here. Sure. So it's really not designed for film. Uh -huh. So they're really going for these. Um, well, we're not embarrassed by the fact that our SLR lenses, yeah. all right, that make up our CP2s. In fact, that's why we showed them together. That's sure. why we show our SLR lenses sure. for motion capture. Yes, we, we designed these for still, but they found, through experience, that they work really well for motion capture. So Well, distance, it's not true about distance. When you design something for, uh, for infinity, the lights come in, you have coma, you have uh, spherical aberration, you have uh, chroma, you, you resolve all these mm -hmm. through optical design. But as soon as you, you focus to a close distance, you're still having all kinds of aberrations. So when you go from here, you know, camera lenses, they go up to one meter. When you start, go, how, how close do these go to? 25 inch? It, well, it depends on the focal length. So okay. they vary by lens. For a 50 millimeter lens, uh, it goes to very close distance. They should. It's, yes. It's a, it's a yeah. cinematography. A, a lens is still going to have its optimal range of where the focus is optimized. Now, there are some lenses in our SLR and our CP2 series that use floating lens elements that allow the designers to optimize focus from close focus to infinity. And we've got four or five lenses in this line that use a floating lens element that help us optimize the focus throughout that range. And there's others that don't. Um, but every lens is going to have its sweet spot in terms of where it's optimized for its use. And, you know, so your 85 millimeter, your hundreds, typically your, your portrait style lenses are designed to be used at two, three, four meter type of distance. They're not designed for close up use because the minimum focus on a lens might be a meter or a little longer than a meter. Each lens, each, again, each lens is going to have its own, its own characteristics in terms of where it's optimized for focus. Uh, during the zoom, there are places you lose the focus and then it goes back to focus again. Um, resolution, oh, MTF, those issues. Because with the zoom, when you have elements, and you have moving elements, you cannot read a light baffle. You have to prepare the light baffle through the range to capture the, you know, so it's very difficult design. Mm -hmm. So tell me about the size. Yeah. So we had a, a decision to make. We, have, we had one lens in our lineup, the lightweight zoom from our Master Prime family. And we, we, this was a, uh, basically it's only one zoom and, and people use companion zooms. This covered the kind of the, the lower focal lengths, 15 and a half to 45. And the lens is superb, but what was missing was the longer uh, zoom lens as a companion. So this found its uh, place mainly for Steadicam operation because it's so light, small. Steadicam operators really like, love this lens. But when we designed the new compact zooms, we had a decision to make about what sensor size to cover. So the lightweight zoom covers a Super 35 chip we decided that the future was going to be a chip that's actually going to be bigger. And 
for the life of these lenses, all right, the lifespan of these lenses is going to be measured 10, 15, 20 years. We know that sensor technology is going to continue growing, getting bigger. So we wanted to make sure that these new lenses cover the biggest chip on the market, and they do. So they're the only cine zoom lenses available today that cover a 24 by 36 sensor size. And like the compact primes, they're available with interchangeable mounts. So I can swap the mounts out between PL, Canon, Nikon, Sony, Micro Four Thirds, invest in one set of lenses, get a bunch of lens mounts, you're good to go. So we announced last year the 7D to 200 T2.9. So many good things about. It's a great lens. Yeah. Um, and we're showing for the first time the 28 to 80, which is the second of the three lens group. And next year we'll introduce a replacement for the 15 and a half to 45. We're not announcing what those specs will be, but it'll be a replacement for that lens. So, as you said, one of the opportunities we have is to convince someone who's currently using a zoom lens made for still photography, an autofocus lens, that might cost $2,500, and to convince them to spend $20,000 on a cinema zoom lens. And the reason for doing this is that a autofocus lens made for still photography was never made for motion capture and throughout its zoom range, you're gonna see a shift in focus. And especially on these larger sensor cameras, the depth of field is so shallow that if I wanna hold critical detail, especially in the eyes, through the zoom range, you need a lens that's gonna be rock solid in that regard. So these lenses are designed with three independent lens group movings, mechanically very much more complex than a autofocus zoom lens would be, so that the focus doesn't shift throughout the entire zoom range. So we have the benefit of the full frame coverage, interchangeable mounts, a true cine style zoom lens, and it's the most affordable cine zoom on the market today. At just under $20,000 list price. So we are looking at, this was 30. This, this is 20 right now. This was actually, it was dropped to the same price. So these were all priced the same. There were $20,000 zooms. Uh, my initial judgment of these two lens, these lenses, because you just, I had them never seen that one. Right. This, this used to be a 35 millimeter frame design no contact. it's a brand new design it's a brand new design yep okay. so yes did we look at the contact zoom lens and say well can we use that design in developing these lenses and the answer was no the aperture was too slow there was too much breathing so we really needed a brand new optical design so what is this digi digi prime about? so digi primes um, these are lenses in search of a camera Oh so, yeah. All right. So, so because two-thirds inch cameras are they're, they're disappearing off the marketplace. So these were lenses designed for three-chip, two-thirds inch cameras that are really being replaced by larger single-chip cameras. We're showing them because there's still two-thirds inch cameras used on the market today, but it's not a huge mover for us anymore. Thank you very much, Richard. A pleasure. Thank you. I'm gonna go and do some testing with these lenses. Yeah, please, yeah, <laughs> good. Thanks a lot. Da -da How much is this camera? Tell me. This one is twenty-eight thousand or so. Last thing I had to 
Steady cam operator's dream. Just straight up. Yeah, like it's a good, it's a decent zoom range zoom lens. Really nice focus though, and opens up to uh, to T28, and the whole thing only weighs like four pounds. It's amazing what these things do. I'm Philip Fisher, I'm the product manager for all the pro camera accessories at Ari. So we have different studio follow focus systems. We have two different and the other one is the FF5 HD. And it has like in inside the FF5 Cine there's a gear ratio of one to two, and the FF5 HD has a gear ratio of one to one. So depending on which kind of lenses you want to work with, like more cine lenses or more ENG broadcast or still lenses. In general, the follow focus system is very versatile and modular. So if you want to change from lightweight to studio, it's just by one click. You go in there and then you're set up from lightweight to studio or the other way around. You can change the focus knobs very easy. You have uh, an extension. It's a modular system. You have different focus knobs available. This is one with hard stops built inside if you need it for still lenses. This is one with two speed, and this, for example, up here is a standard focus knob. Um, you have different uh, focus gears here for the uh, for the lenses. This is yeah. This is kind of the the follow okay, focus system. How do you we have. set different? Uh, how do you set different positions? Uh, two lock, two stop at both ends. Yeah, you can set it here. So if you do it like this, it's free running. If you put it in, then you have the stop mechanism. And then you can oh, set one stop other, here and the other with this one. That's fantastic. Can you tell me what the price is for this? Unit? I don't know have the prices here um, by now. No. Five thousand dollars. No, it's less. less. It's much less. Yeah. It's not. Everybody always thinks Ari is so expensive. It's not so expensive, and we really try to make the best product for uh, like a reasonable price because it's a very good product and I also, good quality. I see that when you had a, uh, Last year? Was it last year? Was promoting um, last year at your yeah, like we had the MFF1 before, and this is the successor of the MFF2. And as well, it's available in two different um, setups, like as well in the Cine and the HD ratio. So, whatever lens you're using, whatever ratio you want to have, it's the same system. And here, you're also like very flexible okay. depending what kind of lens sure. diameter you sure. have. Sure. And also, you can flip the whole unit. If you sure. have a lens like sure. a Nikon lens, which goes the other way around, and again, focus knobs. Sure. You can I use used that everything. last year. I tried it. Uh, it seemed that this is not strong enough to hold it in position. It, it kind of yeah. loses it. No? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I see a cage system here. Is this, is this new? 
Is it something? It's the, w the cage system one we announced or we introduced last year, and now we have the cage system two, mm -hmm. and it's kind. It's a really it's a simple concept, and it's okay. a and it's the first cage system. It was the first cage system on the market where you only could use a left side arm. Um, I can see attach it to the camera, mm -hmm. and you don't yeah. need the right side because sure. it's stable enough, sure. and it's it's lightweight. Mm -hmm. It looks heavier than it is. And if you want to have, want to close the system, you just can add this on the right hand side, but you don't have to. That's amazing. So I see the uh, very uh, complex hole pattern here. Is there an advantage to that? The advantage of our hole pattern, you can see if normally if you mount something in a 3 8 inch, it's still moving because you mount oh, it. Oh, I see. This has and now we have, we have, wow. that's our system, we have registration pins. So it will not move at all. Wow. So that's the idea. You know, you're not going to get the same thing with a magnetic ballast or a non ALF ballast. Non ALF ballast number one is going to draw more current. And of course, a magnetic ballast is you get out what you put in. Then you don't get that voltage rush. Might not be ready. Okay. Yeah, if I saw this uh, type of if you want, push out the last number you know. You want to get into my car. Something is loose here. We it's a mock-up. It's a mock-up. It's not a real lens. It's just a real mock -up. The real lens is on the cameras. <laughs> Without two minutes, two minutes practice, you scared to move. Extreme close up. But if you do that one, you know do it. You know I can do it. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. But the creative level, you come up with the invisible and digital movement combined. Mm -hmm. I'm really excited about that. Uh, anyway, getting on to things, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Sony booth and welcome to our presentation on 4K cameras. You've just seen the trailer for the sci-fi thriller After Earth, directed by M. Night Shyamalan and photographed by Peter Shashitsky on Sony's flagship digital motion picture camera. The work print, like you said, just something you can edit with, Correct. do your cut, and then come back and retrieve the... Final uh, cut, what are you editing on? Final Cut. Yeah. Final Cut just announced the support for 4K XX. Right. But then, how do you do Yeah, you Wow. That's, well, that's yeah. full frame sensor. Full frame sensor. Jesus. I see. Wow. Just for why would you go to a full frame sensor? Why would you? Why wouldn't you? Larger sensor gives you more depth of field control. That's the biggest um, thing. This sensor is basically twice the size of the APS-C sensor. So you get unbelievable control. Yeah, when you have a 16, you have a 2 a So a 16, you have a 2 a 24 on the 77. But uh, Whoa, so, you know, it's really good glass. And it's a constant aperture, too, whereas the 1118, um, I want to say it's a 3.5. So you can go like 29 minutes or whatever, and then they just start again. Okay, folks, at uh, Canon booth, I lost one of my most important interviews. This is the third time this is happening, and I hope it will be the last. Uh, when I was talking with Chuck Westfall, I accidentally had switched off the 48 volt phantom power to my microphone so no voice was recorded uh, in any case Canon has always been my favorite uh, company uh, not only because I w I'm a factory trained technician Canon technician and I've been a camera tech for so many years uh, on Canon cameras but also because it's truly an innovative company I asked Richard who was uh, at, for some time at Canon's R&D department how Canon stays at such creative edge with its optomechanical design. And his answer was they, you know, they use young people, they empower them to, uh, to you know, to do these designs. You know, most established companies, they have a dominating design style. 
if you really want to know uh, a company, uh, a camera, go back to its history and you see originated from a design and it continued in that style. Uh, if you look at Leica camera, you'll find that in the last 70 years, since their introdu introduction of Leica M3, the design, the bio design hasn't really changed. So uh, when discussions are, are made to review new design, new ideas, uh, what uh, is out of that style uh, within an, an established company is usually thrown out. And Canon, uh, you know, Richard uh, was very familiar with Canon's history. And we talked about uh, some cameras that are not related to uh, video, but um, strongly shows how Canon, how innovative Canon is. Uh, we spoke about uh, Canon dial, which is completely, has a different body design than the rest of the cameras of its time. And even today, it's it's a timeless design. Um, Canon uh, T90 uh, sculptured uh, today's modern SLR design, and it's followed by every manufacturer. Um, Canon XL1 was a sensation of its time. It was the first video camera designed to have a film camera look. And the handling was beautiful. Uh, so uh, what I asked him was, uh, when I look at the 3300 zoom, it has a Ariflex Zeiss feel to it. I asked Richard if this was a uh, big challenge for the manufacturing. And he said, well, what people tend to forget is Canon has been uh, producing this type of lenses for so many years. And I found that to be true because um, I think 20 years ago, but when I was at the NAB, I saw the um, Canon 100X zoom. <laughs> and it was very impressive. What we see in a commercial market like Canon EOS lenses, uh, the tolerancing is different from their, you know, uh, cinema, 4K cinema zoom lenses. I asked Richard about ASA 20,000 of Canon EOS C500. And I asked if Canon, the fact that Canon makes his, his own sensors, does that, does that have anything to do with it? And he said that certainly helps. But it's amazing uh, what you can do you know, with this camera. Um, I'd also like to tell you something about body design. Uh, what is my favorite? The originator of this standing look was the Epic, uh, I mean, Red Epic camera, which I think is beautifully designed. Um, my, my favorite body design in all cameras is first the uh, Ari Alexa and then the Epic. I think those are the most nicely designed. Um, the guy knew what he was doing. When he did. And Sony also. Sony makes similar to the Ari Alexa. Uh, but what I specifically like about the Alexa is that there are two insertion holes for 15 millimeter rods in the front of the camera. This is similar to the Rosetta uh, attachment in front of the Ariflex SR cameras, um, which helps to separate the attachments that you attach to the front of the camera than those that you attach to the bottom of the camera. As far as the lens is concerned, uh, I like the proportions in the Zeiss Ultra Prime lenses. These lenses, I find them to be the most beautifully designed lenses, both in their proportion and of course their optical quality, but mostly the body design of the lens is fantastic. The engraving, the handling is perfectly done. It was somebody who does, and I do know that there is a package involving what we just showed you, the augmented reality, and one camera, and I'm told that it's an affordable price. So thank you for coming to the Ross booth, and we do appreciate your time today.